the natural resources of northern Michigan are changing. Lakes and streams, wetlands and uplands, and forests of all kinds are showing the impacts of development, the invasion of non-native plants and animals, and the changing climate. The natural beauty, clean waters, and abundant wildlife that we hold so dear are at risk. But what are those risks, and just what is changing? How are resource experts and community organizations responding? And what can we do to protect our incredible natural resources? Welcome to Nature Change. In this program, we join Bethany Bucklew of the Conservation Resource Alliance in a discussion with two of Michigan's best known and longtime advocates for conservation and outdoor sports. Hello, Nature Change viewers. I'm Bethany Bucklew, one of the team here at Conservation Resource Alliance in Traverse City, Michigan. And today I am here with two of the best known, uh, longest um, leaders of conservation and natural resources in Northern Michigan and CRA board members, Keith Charters and Bob Garner. Thank you for being here with me. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Good morning. Good yeah. morning. Yeah. <laughs> So in a minute, um, I'd like to ask you about some of your experiences and your relationship to natural resources and conservation. But um, if you don't mind, first, I'd like to switch things up a little bit. And I'd like to ask each of you to introduce the other to our Nature Change viewers. So we'll start with you, Bob. Um, what can you tell us about Keith? Um, what should we know? Okay, Keith, has been, Keith has been a leader that, that came, he came out of the business community and he's been one of those leaders that that stepped in without without making a big splash and just consciously directed the conservation uh, consciously directed uh, many of us in the conservation community towards the goal of of, of doing good and, and serving this great old state of Michigan uh, in in a way that that he just has a way with people and. If you're going to have good conservation and you're going to be a leader, you better have a way to do that. And that's Keith Charters <laughs> from the Natural Resources Commission, the longest serving uh, chairman of, of that of that board. Uh, also through the uh, Natural Resources Trust Fund, serving, serving on that board. Uh, he just kept the conversation focused and uh, kept all of us focused on, on doing good. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> And Keith, uh, what should we know about Bob? Who is well, Bob? Well, first Garner? of all, how much do I owe you for those <laughs> comments? <laughs> well, uh, what, what should we know about Bob Garner? I think everybody in the state of Michigan knows Bob Garner. In fact, I got to tell a little story. We were at a ball game recently, and a kid came up with a foul ball and said, "Could you sign this for me?" And that was the first. We, this happens every time we go out to eat. Somebody will come up and say, are you Bob Garner? And he'll just say, what, do I look like him or do I sound like him? <laughs> but at any rate, Bob's been on television many, many years. He's been very active with Michigan, uh, MUCC, Michigan United Conservation Club. He, uh, there's things that people do not know about Bob, such as who uh, he was one of the writers of the Camera Trust Fund, which became the Michigan Natural Resource Trust Fund. Uh, he played a very, very important role in that, and uh, fortunately he got to serve on that board also uh, when he was still a commissioner. And uh, that goes back to 74. He worked for Thomas Anderson, who was part of the Gomery Anderson Act and what, you know, Wetlands one of the, Act, yeah. the Wetlands Act. And that was uh, uh, one of the real uh, major environmental acts that ever happened. Mm -hmm. Of course, the trust fund. And then he went into television with MUCC and uh, Michigan Out of Doors, and now most recently um, Destination Michigan. He's been a long, long time advocate and, and recruiter, I like to say, of people into our conservation movement. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that he's done is getting people excited about be, the conservation and natural resources that we have in this great state. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to know you. <laughs> 52 cents. Um, where did this love of nature originate? Um, was it something in your childhood or where did you first learn about conservation? I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, my father was a great outdoorsman. Uh, he used to raise and train English setters and uh, he was a very avid fly fisherman. Uh, 
And of course, I used to follow him around. I don't even know how old I was, but I was pretty short and small. Uh, and, and I became involved through that. Uh, and still today, I spend way too much time in the woods, uh, especially in the fall. Uh, I, I think so far in October, I've spent 25 days in the woods. I ought to get a life maybe, huh? But, uh, but through my father, mostly. Um, Oh, the connection was dad. Now, my father's been dead over 50 years, okay? But it, would, it was back to those moments where we went uh, deer hunting together, where we, where we uh, went fishing together. That's, that's the basis for it. And that's, that's why Keith and I have always been really concerned that not as many kids are coming up to, to in, in those outdoor activities because with those kids not coming up, then you lose the advocacy. Uh, mm. there's, a, there's a great saying that uh, the, the, the Pine River uh, Trout Unlimited chapter has about they're less concerned about there not being so many 25 inch brown trout in, this, in the stream, in the Pine River, as they are about that there's nobody under 25 fishing. Mm. And that, that's what really concerns them because your outdoor advocacy really comes at that base level of being a kid and have a dad or mom or, or whoever. Now my grandsons, they they both hunt. They're both act, you know active in the outdoors, as is my son, and they will become uh, with with a little coaching, with a little mentoring, uh, and it takes that they will become outdoor advocates, and that's what I'm most concerned about. Is is uh, is it's it's the dads, it's the well, moms. I remember. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I remember uh, shortly after I got on the commission, a reporter was interviewing me, and they said, "What do you? What, what do you? What's your main goal as you remain a commissioner?" And I said, "Recruitment, mentoring, and retention, because we're losing a small percentage every year in the hunting, fishing, and outdoor community, and it may be like two percent, but two percent over ten years is twenty percent." And uh, it, it ought to be reversed. And we tried many things th with the DNR when Bob and I were on the commission from going into the inner cities and uh, starting a program. I can't even remember the name of it now, but do you remember Buck Wilder or yeah, something Buck like Wilder, that? Yeah, Buck Wilder, right. Uh, we, we did the pocket park at the uh, state park fairgrounds in Detroit to recruit again the inner city kids. And, uh, it was it was a primary goal, and it's one of the. It, frankly, it was a major goal of mine and Bob's, and I, I feel like it was something we didn't accomplish. Although I, we may have no, slowed but it that's down. A, but but you got to remember that's a parade, Keith. Yeah, that's yeah. The, you've got constantly new new kids coming right. through, and and uh, Ben Payton, Dr. Yeah. Ben Payton, yep. always always said that. Remember, you're educating a parade yeah. as mm -hmm. they come through. So. Mm -hmm. You, you, you have to say the same things over and over and do the same things over and over in order to take that percentage of folks who get the message and, and put them in, in, uh, in positions where they can show some conservation leadership. And uh, we're, we're, we're old. Our, our, I mean, we're, we are over the hill what is in so this? many ways. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. Yes, seriously. I know, I know, we really are. Yeah. And, and, and so that's, that's all we can hope to do is put those programs out there where where other people uh, take the lead and get these kids outdoors. Yeah. I don't care if they hunt or fish. I mean, I, I would like to see that, mm -hmm. but 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 what I care about is they get a snoot full of fresh air every once in a while, and maybe know what a deer track looks like. And and uh, I, I think some of the some of the best kids I've ever seen come come through uh, come through this are the are the kids that went maybe trapping. With, mm -hmm. with their with uh, with some sort of mentor because they learned about animals and how how critical this is and that's a, the whole climate change thing is yeah. uh, you, you worry about all of that shifting the paradigm has shifted yep. it used to be small game when we were kids yeah that's what you start off now it's all all pretty much deer or bear that's what that's an interesting doing. scenario there when when I started out it was like squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting, yep. mm -hmm. and now they come in and they want a bow and they want to go hunting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so. they want after they, if they complete or or slay a deer, if you will, they're done for the year. Then they go back to, you know, texting. Texting. Ooh, 
Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we're guilty of that too. Okay? Well, uh, I understand we're, that we're, we're guilty, yeah, but yeah. It, but it's by the same by the same token, there's got to be a way to mesh to mesh all of this uh, uh, tech stuff in with uh, in, in with the balance in life and getting outdoors and getting right. that snoop. Forget my mother used to say, "Go outdoors and get the stink blown off you," and <laughs> and and there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. There is. So in a minute, I want to ask you about some of the changes in our natural resources world, and you kind of touched on a little bit of that. But first, I'd like to try a round of rapid-fire questions. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but, no. you know, I'll say one or two words, and then I'm just looking for a one or two word reaction. So first thing that comes to your mind. That'll be the hardest part for Bob and I, one yeah, or two yeah, words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you asked us what oh, time it is, and both of us will tell you how to build a watch factory. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Michigan trout streams. Uh, pure, wonderful. Uh, we have more than any other state. All right. Boardman River Dams. Fun uh, to see them go. Yes. <laughs> Fun to see them go. Unique in the nation, by the way. Okay. Old growth forests. Uh, uh, well, you know, necessary, but, but I'd rather see uh, habitat created. And that's Russ Mason, the chief of wildlife division, makes makes that he says, you know, you do not have they're just absolutely integral. Everything about habitat and, mm -hmm. and wildlife stems around yeah. uh, managing those forests correctly. Right. Okay. Invasive species. East uh, invasive species. Mm -hmm. More to come. More to come. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's changing the management of wildlife. Wildlife habitat. Uh, well, I, I think our, our state does a wonderful job in, in that, and we're fortunate that in Michigan, almost 25% of the land is public land. Mm -hmm. And the other component to that is the private land, such as hunting camps and that, are being managed very, very well. I think we do a top-notch job. Wildlife habitat dependent on forests. Yep. It's dependent yep. on how you manage a forest. Right. Okay. Too many deer. It, it, it dis, dis, disagreement uh, because if you're a hunter, there's never enough mm -hmm. in many ways. And if if I got, I got a got a letter from a lady who had hit eight deer just west of John's place in Isabella County, eight deer in one summer. Yeah. Now, does she think there's too many deer? Yeah. Always the question. Always the big question. What's the balance? Right. And when the DNR used to come up, we think we have 1.8 million deer. I always used to question. How'd you count that? Yeah. You know, and and it was something that if you were in an area that was void or sparse of deer, mm -hmm. I mean, you you got to be nuts, you would think. Uh, there, there's a disconnect there, yeah. and the disconnect is is people don't understand that that's not a number, that's an index. It's an mm -hmm. index, yes. Mm -hmm. Grayling. Boy, there's always hope, isn't there? Yeah, I. It'd be nice, but I, I don't think you and I will see it. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, and, and, and I know this is not one or two words. I did not know until I read the definitive book on trout for the state of Michigan that there were no brook trout in the lower peninsula because of the grayling until they were moved down here in the late 1800s. I had no idea. We all thought brook trout were native. Uh, yeah. And they're a char, too. Yeah, char. So, yeah. Hope, hope, grayling. That'd be fun. Urban sprawl. Urban sprawl. <laughs> He's the expert. Well, uh, you know, we, well, let's go back to recruitment, mentoring, and mm -hmm. retention. Mm -hmm. One of the, the problems that related to that is the migration to urban suburban areas. And... Um, my wife and I had the privilege of heading up a gubernatorial appointed hunting and fishing heritage thing. Well, we found the problems were single parent pa families, mm. the migration to urban suburban area, and that's why earlier I was talking about, you know, the low fruits in the urban suburban areas that we got to get to. A lot of most of the rural area kids will will end up hunting and fishing or outdoor activists. I, I keep saying hunting and fishing, but just get them in the outdoors. Sure. And uh, so urban sprawl, uh, it's not real uh, favorable to 
to recruitment, mentoring, and retention. Mm -hmm. in my, in my rapid fire approach to the words urban sprawl are changes everything. Yeah. Okay. All right, I have one more. Michigan weather. Michigan weather. Uh, well, it's always been this way, you know. Mm -hmm. If you don't like what we got today, stick around for tomorrow because it'll change. <laughs> the, old, the, the old Dylan, the old Dylan line, the times, they are changing. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, I agree with that. Uh, but uh, part of our weather is, the, the result of it is mm -hmm. these wonderful natural resources that we have in the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a better month than October? I mean, the good Lord has got a paintbrush in an easel that's unsurpassed. I, I drive around and I think, you know, why isn't there two Octobers? Right, right. Okay. Just, everything smells better. <laughs> Having been keen observers of natural resources for a number of years, you've likely seen many changes in the natural world. Uh, you talked about a, a few of those, but what kind of changes have you seen in the natural world over the, the recent years and since the past? I think one of the things you really have to note is, is and it really isn't a change, but it's, it's everything cycles, mm -hmm. you know, th things, things cycle. And, and you really don't understand that until you get old. <laughs> and, 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 and you see that happen, but we're seeing, we're seeing uh, natural changes in the fact that uh, uh, we're seeing fewer and fewer varying hairs, snowshoe hairs mm -hmm. in the state. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact we're, having less snow and the, and the hair, the hair hides mm -hmm. by changing its color, you know, seasonally. Mm. And when those seasons are in, are disrupted, as they seem to have been, um, and, and I think that, uh, of course, habitat loss there is, is a key factor, but I think it's also, uh, we're, we're seeing seasonal changes. Woodcock, uh, for example, right. uh, which used to be in great abundance and, and are linked to, uh, linked to uh, how we manage our aspen forests, our aspen resource, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're seeing fewer and fewer woodcock overall. Uh, okay. Just things like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's around the edges that, that I notice the, the yeah. changes. Well, and I've lived long enough, I was raised on the east side of the state, and the fishing was, you know, other than perch was not so good. Today it's a wonderful fishery, now, you know, arguably. arguably. But uh, in, in just different things, like who would ever thought we'd have the wonderful fishery of salmon? Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, that had been the last thing in the world we'd ever thought of. Uh, and, it, and, and the warmth, the, the warmth of change right. and the invasive species, mm -hmm. the invasive species, have every lake in this state is a dirty test tube yeah. because of some invasive species or because somebody got the idea, there's no pike in this lake, let's put some some, uh, mm -hmm. some pike in. So we're having this moving target all the time. And and this this moving target that we are expecting everybody to try and adapt to. It's been great, great changes in some regard, and it's been just terrible in, in other regards. One of, another one, Bob, is like the quality deer management. Everyone thinks it's great, you let them go and grow. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they do not uh, harvest the equivalent amount of does, so it's self-defeating to the habitat. I mean, too many deer, right? Not and enough habitat. It, we always have. I always have the saying that everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And <laughs> and sometimes you have to to do some things, yeah. right. to make to make that heaven. Well, occur. many people seem concerned about the impact of deer browsing on young forests, and it's a big concern as we try to regrow forests damaged by beech bark disease and other invasives and so sounds like you have a oak um, will um, oh, yeah. we're getting people complaining with uh, you know all the oaks are dying and and, mm -hmm. and what happens when when uh, when the forestry cuts those oaks because they're worth so much oak isn't worth anything now yeah. firewood not worth much anything firewood firewood mm -hmm. yeah, yeah nobody but, wants oak furniture nobody you know things yeah. change all yeah. right. this changes right. bob and i experienced that uh, last week wasn't it we were out grouse hunting, and there was one area that we were at that was just incredible how many dead, the, the big beautiful oaks. oaks, kind that dropped the acorns mm -hmm. for the, you know, all the critters to eat, right. deer, squirrels, grouse. Mm -hmm. 
So when you think of trends that you've seen, uh, what are you most concerned about? So we talked a little bit about your past experiences with conservation and growing up and how you first had that love for the outdoors. But looking into the future and the future of Michigan's natural resources in particular, what, it's, what does the future of the outdoors look like for our children, our grandchildren, and the next generations? Well, uh, an area of concern to me is, goes back to what we were talking about, recruitment, mentoring, and retention. Mm -hmm. All this management, how is it paid for? Licenses and fees. Mm -hmm. And if, if you have the, the amount of people entering into it going down, who's going to pay for the stewardship? Now, I frankly do not really trust the government to pick up the tab. I mean, it always seems like our resources get behind many, many other things. Mm -hmm. being, I admit to being biased. It's at the top of my priorities. But, uh, it's a good bias. Keith. Yeah, I understand that. But uh, I, I worry about, and I, having seen it when, when we were on the commission, that uh, who's going to pay for the stewardship for our kids and our grandkids? if? Mm -hmm. If the amount of interest is going down and the amount of uh, licenses are going down and fees, mm -hmm. they always complain about fees. So it concerns me who's going to pay for it because I don't trust the, the government, the state of Michigan, to pick up the tab that's necessary. I still think we should have we should have taken that bold stroke. We can still do it. We can still do it. If we to, to put it on the ballot, go get the signatures, put it on the ballot, and say that one penny one penny out of all the money raised in this state, one penny out of, out, out of 100 is going to go to uh, ag and natural resources. And that's all it'd take. And I think there'd be support for that. Yeah, well, every time that we put something on the ballot, such as your trust fund uh, yep. bills or proposal P, which was for parks and recreation, mm -hmm. passes by an overwhelming majority, like 68%. Uh, it's, 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 it's time to go. The problem is my 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 pal and I are getting old, <laughs> okay, and and we've been Reminder through enough again. battles that we that, that it is exactly those we have to look out at the troops out there and say somebody's got to take take the leadership role. We had our time, yeah. That's why I think it's time yeah. now to take. If you look in the history of Michigan conservation, it was people taking action. Those duck hunters yep. we talked about that. That when, when all those ducks were killed in the Detroit River, they 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 put them in a put them in a truck and dumped them on a front lawn of the Capitol, and then things happened. Yeah. Okay. When we couldn't get the bottle bill, we couldn't get the legislature to agree to that. It went out, got the signatures, put it on the ballot. It passes. Things happen. Mm -hmm. Things happen when we take action. Concern is, are those are people out there? Are there the people out there that can step up and take that action? That's my concern. All right. Um, is there anything either of you wanted to touch on or that we want to talk about before well, we... Well, going back a little to, to the, just the previous conversation there, I, you know, they used to say, are you a Republican or Democrat? Mm -hmm. I was a Republican appointee, and Bob was a Democrat yeah. mm -hmm. appointee. Uh, it, it, it never it, got in the way. Yeah, well, it never got in the way, but it, because it's not a political thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know... Saving our natural resources and managing our natural resources and figuring out who's going to pay the tab in the future, who's going to be the stewards of those mm -hmm. natural resources, that's not a political thing. It's just what's right mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. It's what makes Michigan what it is. Yeah. It seems so easy, doesn't it? Yeah. Doesn't it? <laughs> you know, when I went to work in the legislature, Joe, Joe Vandermeulen was there as a science mm -hmm. advisor. Well, he came actually later than I did. I, I used to say we'd go, we'd go to work there and think all things were possible. And now anything is suspect. And, and that there's a mindset that needs to change there, too. All right. Well, I think I've learned a lot today, and I appreciate both of you being here on behalf of CRA and Nature Change. And um, I thank you for being here. <laughs>